Hey everybody, I want to thank you for joining me at jessefizio.com. Um, today, I'm talking with someone you may already know quite a bit about. His name is Ursin Logioso. He is a physical therapist, owner of the manualtherapist.com. Um, he has a list of credentials that goes a mile long, but some of the more popular ones would be that of uh, being credentials, credentialed in mechanical diagnosis and treatment from McKenzie Institute. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physiotherapy and the creator of the EDGE uh, tool system and other products to enhance therapist clinical practice. So today I want to welcome to the program, uh, Ersten Logioso. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, and you can mispronounce my name as long as I can mis- mis- uh, mispronounce yours. I- I always mispronounce it. Ersten Religioso. No? Religioso. So the G is silent. The G is an H. Oh, uh, got it. Right. That's right. Um, I would okay. say A-witness. Yes, that's what everyone... No one knows how to say my name, and that's uh, that's okay. Yeah, I was just talking um, to Jason so Schwede, wanted... actually. And I said, I think Jesse's mispronouncing his own last name. I'm um, sorry about that. Yeah, um, <laughs> I definitely am mispronouncing my own last name. That's right. what it is, for yeah. sure. Um, so what I want to do today is simply ask a few questions that people I'm sure are interested to know about a successful person like yourself. I find people like reading biographies on people who are uh, preeminent in their field and people know a lot about um, gives them kind of a, a roadmap for where to go for their own practice, especially as a new graduate. You're not exactly sure how to go and where to start. So um, what I want to do is ask some questions regarding your career and how you got started in this business. Is that OK? Yeah, no problem. All right. So first thing I'm curious to know, Erson, is um, when, in fact, do you decide to become a physical therapist and what led you to that decision? Well, it's funny. Uh, my parents are MDs and I always wanted to kind of get into the medical field. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to be a doctor one day. I mean, everyone just kind of expected me to be a doctor. They had four boys and they always wanted one of them to be a doctor, a real doctor, as my wife would say, not a doctor of physical therapy. Um, so I I had a girlfriend in high school and she was in a pretty bad car accident and I attended some of her PT sessions and I thought, this is pretty cool. So why don't I do this? And uh, I went into PT school and with the, in the back of my mind thinking, if I don't like this, I'm just going to go to med school. If I don't like this, I'm just going to go to med school. And I thought that up until the very first day of my very first clinical affiliation, and it was in an acute care. And uh, even though that's not the the realm I ended up in, because I do outpatient ortho and cash base now, um, I thought after seeing several day, uh, several patients that day and helping them ambulate and seeing post-op total knees or what have you, I remember calling my parents that day uh, and, and I was just so ecstatic. And I said, you know what, this is what I want to do. I had such a great first day and I want to be a physical therapist. Wow. And when was that? Oh, God. <laughs> I was probably 95 or 96. I'm old. Okay. But were you, you, you said you were in high school at that time? No, 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 no. After high school, I went to PT school. Right, right, right. So, oh, right. Cause at, the, at that point it was a, a BSc, right? Cause, uh, um, as of now, at least in Canada where I'm situated, you have to do an undergrad degree, same thing in the States now, and then you can go into your MSc, which in the States is the DPT. Right. Well, at, um, it was one of the very first dual MSBS programs, which they phased out. But yeah, I, I graduated with a BS and MS in PT. Okay. And ever since you became PT, think back early in your career, um, what were some of the big surprises that you didn't anticipate um, that would be relevant for you when you were still a student? Um, early in my career, I would say, unfortunately, there weren't enough surprises um, you know, I decided to do a residency slash fellowship and there was no difference in the U S at the time, uh, back in 98. So my residency ended up being almost, I was grandfathered in as a fellow because the requirements for it were kind of a combination of what both programs are now. And it was more stringent and harder to do back then. So because I did that, um, I took all of Parrish's courses. I did like a over year long fellowship slash residency, then I took all the McKenzie courses and I took all the Institute of Physical Art courses, a bunch of Mulligan courses. Um, I basically took probably too much. Uh, and I, I was I was kind of a know-it-all. And I, must, I might still be a know-it-all, just I'm more humble about it now. 
So yeah, I think, yeah. What I what I like to say is there was not enough surprises back then because I I just thought I knew everything I can treat everything, and the surprises pretty much came much later when you know pain with the advent of pain science in two thousand and two I took one of Butler's first courses and it really made me question a lot of things. But at the time, I was only dabbling in it. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, I'm 18 years out now, and I feel less confident about how I treat things than I did back then, which I think is always a good thing. I mean, you should always be questioning your career. You should always be questioning what you're going to take next and and why these things work and what is the best thing for these patients and why I'm doing it rather than being 100% supremely confident that I know exactly why this patient has pain and exactly what they need. Yeah, and I think that's the point that you made there. I don't know if you you know that you made it in that when you finished school, you took a quite quite extensive series of con ed courses. And I think a lot of new grads do now because they feel very, you know, deer in the headlights when they first get out. They don't know what they're doing. Pain is more complex than what textbooks kind of make it out to be. Um, and I think what may be a huge difference now as opposed to, I don't know, when you finished back in the uh, back in late the 90s. Day, back in the day, it. back in the day, um, they uh, we have the internet now and social media, so uh, you can do a lot of reading online that you may not necessarily have had access to uh, back in the day, and I think that may change people's percept- perspectives on what they're learning. Just like me, I did my fellowship in orthopedic manual therapy. I finished physio school back in two thousand ten. And at that time, I was just still indoctrinated in what I was being taught in school. But at the end of the day, after reading, you know, David Butler, uh, I was classmates with Greg Lehman. And at the time, uh, at the time, I didn't uh, really like the guy that much because I he confused me too much. <laughs> okay, so I was just asking Urson about some of the kind of surprises he's ha- he had when he finished physiotherapy school and some of the stuff he didn't really expect. Um, and he mentioned a series of courses he did, Mulligan, McKenzie, so on and so forth. Um, one of the comments that I made to him regarding that uh, school of thought was what, one difference between the late 90s when Urson finished his physiotherapy education and now is the advent of social media. Um, right now, you can access a plethora of information on pain science, orthopedics, manual therapy, anything basically you're interested in and learn all about it. There's a, the pro to that is the access you have of information at your disposal right now. The con to that is I think the confusion that lends itself to, to therapists. So when you first start when you first start first started uh, your social media platform or did you find that you were confused or um, not quite sure how to integrate some of the stuff you were reading at the time into your clinical practice? Uh, well, I think you're still talking about a, a much larger tar- time frame. I mean, at the time, when I after I had taken all these courses, I mean, we'll back up a little bit. So integrating McKenzie and Paris, uh, Butler concepts, Mulligan and Institute of Physical Arts stuff, I mean, those are kind of the basis of uh, my early career, like the first 10 years or so, I I didn't really um, know how to do all that. I mean, because there's such disparate concepts in terms of everyone's idea. Everyone says you have to do it our way. Everyone says you have to assess this way and treat this way. And if you use our system and our system only, then you'll get 80 to 90% of patients better. But the thing is, every system will tell you that and everyone, every guru will have the charisma and kind of placebo, therefore, behind them, that they will get a lot of people better. And I think the fallacy with that is they think that just because they get people better, whatever they're preaching is correct in terms of mechanisms. And, you know, that that still holds true today. So you fast forward to when I started blogging, that was maybe only seven or eight years ago at this point. Um, did I have a hard time integrating it by then? No, by then... You know, after two or three years of trying to kind of see what worked and see what didn't work in terms of my style, um, I was still doing a lot of tissue work and neuromobes and repeated motions. Um, definitely integrated way more pain science than I did when I took Butler's courses. But if you look back at my early blogs, I mean, I was still very mechanistic and um, somewhat pathoanatomical, although I, I had definitely moved away from that. But at the time, I still thought I could deform fascia and joint capsule and all those things. So again, if you look at my early blogs, I was bruising people with the edge 
and telling my students <laughs> that uh, if you didn't, if you didn't brew someone by the end of the week and not being aggressive enough, because again, I think the, I made the same error that everyone else does. If you have results by hurting someone and they end up feeling better, then you think that you actually have to hurt someone to make them feel better just because you got results and results doesn't mean your mechanisms are correct. It just means you got results. Mm -hmm. So when you decided to kind of calm things down and go a little more gentle, did you find your results changed? Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of the story I tell at each one of my courses. I basically say that my visit average maybe went from eight to 10 to four to six or so, because I think a lot of that extra soreness they were getting between visits was actually caused by me. Hmm. Yeah, I can hear that. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I think it's one of those things that people say, oh, you're going to be sore between visits, or people think that PT means pain and torture, you know, unfortunately. And, it, you know, if, if a patient is in constant pain, my rule is that you just shouldn't, they shouldn't walk out feeling worse, because sometimes you can't do anything other than teach them movement strategies and pain education because they're in constant pain. But if, pa if a patient has intermittent pain, they shouldn't ever leave feeling worse and they shouldn't expect that they're going to be sore unless they're just, it's like DOMSI type sore from exercise. Like manual therapy shouldn't make someone sore. And I think that, that that's a big misconception. Interesting. So with that school of thought, are you uh, a proponent of dry needling, which we know can make people sore? I think anything can make people sore. Um, I've definitely, when I experienced dry needling, I was sore in some spots and other spots I wasn't sore at all and it gave me quite a bit of relief. So it, it's, it's crazy that, um, I mean, I can't really do it in New York. I can practice it and I can teach it, but I can't use it on patients. When I say practice, I don't mean part of my clinical practice. I mean, I can do it on family and friends, but I can't bill for it. it it's a hard thing for me to integrate because I try to make all my techniques hundred percent pain-free again, unless someone's in pain, then I try not to make them worse. I try to actually modulate their pain. So it's a hard thing for me to integrate. And it's kind of like third or fourth in my repertoire after I've tried other things. And maybe they just need a bigger shock to the nervous system. Because I just think it's, it's again, it's just another novel strategy. I don't think you need to go hunting and poking for, um, you know, tr trigger points, which may or may not exist. And I don't really even care about that. Um, but, you know, as soon as you mention trigger points, a whole bunch of people, like the same group of people, always jump all over that. And I don't really care. I mean... If people want to do that, that's fine. I have a hard time integrating it. I think it works well and it works amazingly, but I seem to get the same results with ISTM and repeated motion strategies. So, I mean, why would I have to go invasive? I don't have to worry about causing a pneumothorax with my edge tool. <laughs> I don't think you will with that, no. Um, and I think that's an interesting point you said that uh, you still get results doing what you do aside from using dry needling. And I think a lot of physiotherapists or people in rehab in general uh, get results by doing a, a myriad of different techniques and different philosophies of how to practice. I think that in, as opposed to that being kind of like a cool thing, people should know that, hey, I don't have to do what this guy does. I can still get patients better. I think at least for uh, some subsects of, of the physiotherapy population, it might be a negative because they, they feel that um, it doesn't matter what you do. Has there's no there's no difference. People are going to get better or worse. It's kind of like a predetermined uh, outcome. Um, because if I do needling and you do repeated motions, and the patients both get better, both, both, both get better. Um, who's to say who did what to make that patient feel better? Right. Um, it, I think it matters, and it it doesn't matter, and it matters, right? I mean, when when in modern manual therapy studies, and again, I'm not talking about my brand, modern manual therapy. I'm just talking about studies that look at you plug that or something. Right. Pitting, pitting one, one thing versus another. Like when they look at STM versus manipulation or mulligan techniques versus traditional mobilization or manipulation versus mobilization, the patient just seems to get better no matter what. And you can easily come, a, come across, or I mean, you can, you can come to the conclusion that it doesn't matter what I do. And to some degree, it doesn't matter what you do. But I like to say that, you know, patients have preferences in their food and their, t in their tastes and, you know, where they like to go and what they like to wear. So their, their nervous system also may have preferences as well in terms of what it considers novel and what it considers threatening. So, I mean, some people uh, may have had a terrible experience with getting grass and they got beat to, you know, they got the, the crappy out of them. Their IT band is brew. So when I come out with my edge tool, they're like, I don't want that, but they had a very positive experience with needling because they weren't sore and they just had, um, 
you know, good outcomes with that. So if, if they prefer something and you don't have it in your toolbox, that's probably one reason why you should have a bigger toolbox. I mean, I see the arguments against the toolbox and I see the argument for the toolbox. And I think the only reason why you should have a bigger repertoire is if a patient definitely prefers it. And it, that's the only thing that they think is going to make them better. You know, in the argument against the toolbox, which everyone is trying to always um, improve is that it, it doesn't really give you anything in terms of patient education, because it's really the education and what they do at home that makes it stick because everything really is transient. And if, yeah, I think a lot of people um, might find that pill hard to swallow. Um, I know I did. Like, I think you know this very well because you've, you've been talking to me since I started practicing. Um, we begin, I think a lot of us begin our journey to becoming physiotherapists, chiropractors, athletic therapists, whatever the case may be, with the thought that we're able to use our hands to make people feel better. We can fix people. We have that magic hand, that ability. Um, and then you quickly learn that, I don't know if that's the case. I think you can temporarily make someone feel a little better or looser or more free in their motion. Um, but they'll come back week after week with the same complaint unless you kind of reinforce what you're doing with a specific exercise program um, that they have to be compliant with. Um, and I think you, you wrote a blog, post about the, a blog post about this a long time ago that I really liked talking about patient compliance and some tips on how to get it. Um, and I think uh, that is an art in and of itself. Picking the right intervention for the right patient at the right time. It's all what, what patients are willing to do. Um, and sometimes you can't just ask a patient, are you going to do this? I think sometimes you have to just... I'm trying to think of a better word to say. You just have to kind of read that patient, feel them out to make sure that they're comfortable and they're willing to do what uh, you need them need them to do to get better. Um, can you speak to that, Erson? Having having done this for such a long period of time, um, would you say one of the things you learned is being able to read the patient to fit the intervention to that patient where they are at their time of their pain cycle or their healing? Yeah, I mean, in general, I think we all have our top three interventions that we like to use and we all have the same kind of metaphors and analogies and stories but i i like my favorite part of the the uh initial session is the history you know and, and people are surprised when they see me treat live patients like there's some seminars where um, some hosts have just had me treat patients all day and everyone just kind of watched me and they're surprised because 45 minutes of it may have been actually just doing the history and interaction and me getting their story out of them doing a couple of re repeated motions, finding a directional preference, maybe doing manual for five minutes and then teaching them some sort of home program. And, you know, th these were patients that er like every other guru, other, other therapists had failed with. And they were surprised again, because the brand of being the manual therapist or modern manual therapy, they expected me to put my hands on them more. And I really like to, to see what the patient is responding to. If I see someone's eyes clouding over and, or they're kind of getting upset the more pain sciencey I get, you know, sometimes you do have to go pathoanatomical. I mean, I mean, I'm currently either going to film like a Facebook live or write a blog post that says it's going to be called uh, modern manual therapy, zero pathoanatomy too, because currently I'm losing the pathoanatomy in the past couple of weeks for, for a couple of patients, <laughs> you know, cause sometimes um, as much as we should be moving away from pathoanatomy, sometimes it does matter. Sometimes someone's perfectly sensitized and, you know, the pain science people like to go all in with it, but you can't, you can't go all in with anything. I mean, um, Corey Zimney, who writes for my blog sometimes, and he teaches for ISPI, he uh, actually gave me a study and, and told me that even with pain science, it doesn't work as well in the clinic as it does in research. Right. That's interesting. Um, right. I know. I know. Clinically, uh, one one of the things that I've had to work around with over the past number of years is just reading that patient out when you're taking their history. You're asking them. One of the questions I ask patients, and every time after my history, is I ask them, "Why do you think you have the problem you have?" Um, because that's a huge answer. Why they feel they have whatever problem it is that they're coming to see you for. Because um, if they feel their joint is out of place or they have uh, a torn muscle or something of that nature, that immediately gives you information of where their head's at and how you can go about maybe shifting that perspective gently. Um, if you just read a blog on how to implement pain science and you start talking about neuroplasticity, and you start talking about uh, path anatomy doesn't matter, uh, degeneration and tears on MRIs and all that stuff is completely normal. 
Uh, maybe there's some patients that would find that interesting initially, but there are a hell of a lot who would definitely um, rebel against hearing that right off the bat. I think you have to buy have the patient buy into you first before you can start talking to about talking to them about um, changing their perspective. And again, I think that takes time to be able to do that um, in a clinical setting when you're so new and you're very you know you're very by the book still. Right. Um, um, yeah, you know, one thing I'd like to add to that in terms of reading the patient, I mean, again, I've interacted with thousands of patients at this point, and I can clearly tell when someone's buying my explanation, someone's not. And, you know, I like to talk about people as rapid responders and slow responders. And regardless of how long they've had their complaints, most people are rapid responding. Most people are there because they want to be helped. And most people are going to take whatever explanation you give them. I mean, if I, like, I would say, you know, I also throw out to 80%, 80% of people would would love the jelly donut theory as much as 80% of people would love my new explanation of repeated motions being um, the loss of ability to accept load and you, you unload too much. So we have to restore your ability to, to accept load um, because your joint physically and your brain mentally thinks that load is a threat. So, I mean, no matter what, people are going to accept whatever explanation you throw at them. I even said that pain science in itself is a placebo. Cause if I said something like, all pain comes from your pituitary gland and research says that, I mean, if I just said make up a completely random thing, but it sounds like it knows, you know, what I'm talking about, what's pain science, anything more than just reassuring someone and getting rid of their kinesiophobia. It has nothing to do with the facts because no one, no one one cares about the facts. They just care about, Oh wow, this guy really made me feel better. It's okay to move, but I don't necessarily have to give them facts for it. So even itself, pain science is a placebo and, but and, and no matter what you say or do, if you're a charismatic, empathetic person, you're probably going to get them better. Because what what do we do with anything? Rather, I mean, all we're really doing is putting the patient's nervous system in such a state that it's ready to accept change. Absolutely, well said. Um, I think that one question I get asked a ton. I'm sure you you know more than me from other courses you teach. Um, is what course should I take next? What should I do? Um, and they, I got asked that all the time and I always scratch my head. Like for example, I do, uh, I finished all my levels in the, in the Canadian orthopedic system. You, you're a fellow now, right? You're a fellow. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a fellow. And, right. um, and, whatever that um, means these days, right? Yeah. I'm a, it's I don't presti- really. It's prestigious. We studied a lot. Yeah, you did. I did. I will say, I tell patients or, um, other physiotherapists, they don't give that away. Like you work your ass off for it. Like it's a lot of studying, a lot of exams, and so forth. But when people ask me, um, should I do this? Should I take a um, an upper extremity manual therapy or spinal blah, blah blah course through our Canadian system? I don't always. I don't jump to saying yes right away. I'm not like yes, you must. It's great to do. I say, what? Do you, where's your head? Like, what do you think? What do you? What do you? What, what do you? How do you like to practice? Um, because I don't think there is any one way a physiotherapy uh, physiotherapist should go when they're thinking about taking con ed. So I just want to get your input. Um, if uh, somebody asks you, what should I take? What course should I take? Should I do my fellowship as an example? What do you, what do you like to tell them? Um, I definitely always used to say you should take McKenzie courses, and I, I, I still stand by that. There are some instructors that are more well-versed in pain science and the biopsychosocial approach. And there are some that are probably still hardcore with the jelly donut theory. But in the end, you end up with a system that gives you very reliable and easy to use assessment that is based on movement and not palpation. And you also get a step-by-step kind of blueprint for how to treat a patient based on the assessment. Because your assessment, you end up with a classification rather than a diagnosis. And we would know from research that when you classify a patient, it helps improve outcomes versus getting a diagnosis. It doesn't really help you, you know, dic- it doesn't dictate your treatment in any way. Um, and, and it also enables you to change the, beha- the patient's behavior because you see, lo- you see the instructors interacting with patients and w- with live patients as opposed to just course participants. Um, and, and change behavior is really what makes a patient better because, again, you know, whether it's repeated motions or strengthening or some sort of FMS type home program, people seem to get better when they just start moving in ways that, that are novel. And when they start moving in ways that uh, don't kind of set off their CNS alarm. Um, so it's like, if you can just get someone moving and with less kinesiophobia, you'll, you'll get them better. But I mean, most courses don't tell you to how to do that. And I think because it's so systemized, 
and because it's simple, people want simple. I mean, I, I gravitated toward complex with all this pathoanatomy and a hundred different ways to palpate and assess and manipulate. But in the end, what really made a difference is just teaching patients simple things as opposed to, and using simple assessments as opposed to doing like a hundred different manipulations. So I, I still highly recommend that, but it, you know, in and of itself, it's, it's still too pathoanatomical and it doesn't treat everyone and, and they tend to treat very locally. And sometimes you do have to go, uh, you know, a hip patient isn't always a hip patient. Sometimes you, you have to look at their ankle. Sometimes you have to look at the thoracic spine or their opposite shoulder for whatever reason, maybe it's due to their activities. So, you know, I like the SFMA as well, as much as I, I don't think that. Again, you, you take one thing too far and it's like, oh, for every ankle patient, I need to look at their right shoulder too. If it's a left ankle patient, no, that's not true because an ankle is sometimes just an ankle, you know, so it, it's hard for me to recommend. I do like MDT. I do like the SFMA. I absolutely recommend uh, taking any of Butler's or um, Mosley's courses there. If you want to just read therapeutic neuroscience education, I think that is my number one recommended textbook um, in terms of pain science research. So there, there are those things. I mean, if you want to take needling, that's fine. I like Kineticore. I haven't taken any of the other ones because uh, they integrate it with movement assessment. So I can't speak to the other ones, even though I hear my pain is good. Um, my course is modern manual therapy, of course. It kind of integrates a little bit of everything. Got to got to plug that. But that's in great. general, you know, it, it's hard for for me to recommend because when people even ask me, "What am I going to take next?" I mean, I'm so kind of jaded at this point. It's not like I feel like. I, oh, you are? Yeah. Well, it's not that I don't, I don't feel like I know everything, but I feel if someone's like, Hey, are you going to take DNS? I'm like, I don't know if I could reconcile that with my current treatment approach, you know, cause I don't think that you need to go through the entire developmental sequence to make mm-hmm. someone better. Um, I think I'd learn, I'd like to learn what they have to say and kind of just, I mean, pretty much what everyone does, the, you, you don't ever take, very few people ever take an entire system, go into it hundred percent dogmatically and, and only use that. Most people just kind of take bits and pieces of whatever system they they have taught. They don't go through the entire series and they take, oh, I like this assessment. I like this. And, you know, they, they find out what works and they take one or two things from every series of courses. So that's why, I mean, that's why when I start my courses, I say, look, if you learn one thing from my course that you could use every day, it's worthwhile. Fair enough. And I'm the same way when I take Con Ed, um, I always spend the day after do- uh, the course just kind of going through it and taking what I like and kind of abetting what I don't. And I think from anybody, any any course you take, even if you're listening to a, like a lecture online um, or going to MedBridge and looking at their courses, you're going to take things from them. You're going to learn a few things. Even if you don't know you're learning them, in the back of your head, they'll be there. So you see that patient, you're like, I remember learning this on a, on a course and it will kind of fit into your clinical picture um, and you'll become more holistic. So when people ask me what course should I take, it implies to me that they think that course is going to change their clinical practice. And I don't say it won't. I'm like, it, there's no, I don't think there's one, there's one course that will drastically change someone's fundamental clinical practice. That takes time and to involve and kind of figure out what you feel most comfortable doing. Um, and, you know, like I said, as a new graduate physiotherapist, uncertainty is not your best friend and you want to know everything. And you, like, I'm sure you told me you took a ton of content when you finished and that probably was in a, in a way because you wanted to know everything and you felt um, kind of at odds with what you knew versus how patients presented and you wanted to reconcile that. And that was through uh, con ed, unless I'm mistaken. You just love yeah, just take, was, taking weekends off. I was off. searching for the next best thing. You know, I thought that soft tissue work would be it or neurodynamics or, pain science or manipulation very early on then it ended up being istm so then it was breathing and then a couple of years ago it was nutrition and it's kind of like every single thing i think is to basically reach the patients that you're not helping because in the end we're all we're always trying to better ourselves so we can better help our patients not necessarily because we want to be or know-it-alls i mean yeah sure i, I used to think i'm a know-it-all um but and every single time I, I think I stumble upon the answer, which is less and less now, it's always just to help, even if I can help like one extra patient that I couldn't help before. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I don't know where I go now other than maybe learning. <laughs> I don't know. I've been, I've, been actually, <laughs> I've been actually asking myself this. You've learned everything there is to know. No, it's not even that. I, 
that's I'm it. just too skeptical at this point. I don't know what system um, currently is going to fit in with with mine right now. I mean, you know, I like Chris Johnson stuff. I want to know more about running and more about running mechanics and more about maybe athletes and strengthening and programming, but it's not necessarily stuff about treatment. Mm-hmm. Fair right enough. Then. So one more thing to shift gears a bit. I th- um, that if, if you're uh, if the people listening don't know, how many children do you have, Erson? <laughs> I have five kids. I have four girls, and I just had a boy, and he'll be six months old tomorrow. That's amazing! Congratulations! It's incredible. How many? And how old are all your kids again? Cool. Uh, Sophia is nine. Maya is seven. Emmy is five. Layla is two. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kiko, which is really Francisco, he'll be six months. So okay. okay. So the reason I asked that, bring that up, is because I think another issue people have in our profession is the the management of time. And just by you having five kids, a wife, business, a website, a house, how do you how do you manage uh, your time um, between treating your business, your family? Do you have any tips in that respect? That's hard. I mean, I did a, an entire podcast with Jeff Moore about the work life balance, and he's on the other end with that. I mean, and he, if you guys know him from Twitter and his Periscopes, I think he has a lot of good messages, but. You know, he basically said something like right before the podcast, he's like, yeah, you know, we just moved. I forget. It was like from Chicago to Wisconsin or something far. Right. He's like, yeah, I just flew my I just drove my family out to Wisconsin. And as soon as I dropped them off at the new house, I flew back, picked up my my pickup truck, drove all the way back, uh, took like whatever, three or four day drive. And then as soon as as soon as I got dropped off my truck, I flew to L.A. and I taught a course for a week or something. and, And I just thought. I would be divorced if I did that. You know? <laughs> How do I do it? I teach one course only a month. I could probably do much more than that. I mean, but to me, family is first and foremost. And, um, you know, they, they love me a lot. So I don't treat in a clinic as much as I used to. I basically work maybe two mornings a week. Okay. Um, I mean, truthfully, when I first started blogging again, I don't know how I did it. I was working your typical 30 to 40 hour work week. I literally blogged every day. My blog posts were a lot longer. I mean, now they're a lot shorter because of like Twitter and we have like, you know, 140 character attention span. And uh, if we watch a viral video, if it doesn't capture attention in 10 seconds, I mean, my videos used to be, I used to have like three, five minute videos in each blog post. Now all my videos are like a minute to a minute and a half because they got to fit on Instagram, right? So, I mean, I I just, I put my time and resources where I think it's going to give me the most bang for my buck. I focus a lot on social media advertising. I want to be kind of on the present and like YouTube and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and I have podcasts and I have a premium site. So my outreach, I think, um, you know, my focus is is more on my products and my courses rather than patients. I I still see patients. I still like, I mean, physical therapy is a passion for me, but you know, what I said on my podcast, and this was like contrary to Jeff Moore, it's like you have to set goals for yourself at some point. And when you've met those goals, you have to slow down. Like you can't, I mean, his whole point is like, oh yeah, new grads, they want to do a work-life balance. He's like, but you got to work your ass off to get to that balance. And and my my message, and it wasn't necessarily to him, but it was to anyone. I was like, yeah, you got to have a work-life balance. And people say like, oh, there is no work-life balance. You got to work, 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 work. But in the end, like no one's going to remember the guy who just worked 60 hours a week and his family never saw it. I mean, I, right. I, get to, I get to go to every single one of my kids' gymnastics meets unless I'm teaching. You know, I drop them off at gymnastics every day. We run 5Ks together. Um You know, mm-hmm. so it, it's like I'm at the point in my life, in my career, where I worked so hard in, in, you know, for the past six or seven years and really kind of you know, brought up my products and my seminars that I could, I could not work as much in the clinic. And, you know, some people are like, well, you're not as much of a clinician. I'm like, look, I put in like 15 years seeing everyone. I don't buy from... that. <laughs> What's that? I don't buy that. Already. That's not true. You're still just because you don't treat as many as you use. It doesn't mean you're not a clinician. Right. So, uh, you know, there's some people who are like, oh, he's not um, whatever you got. It's like somehow you got to put in 40 hours of work week to be a clinician. I mean, I still see cases and I still see cases that people aren't getting better. And I still see very easy cases because in the end, most cases are very easy, even if they've had pain for, for years. Most people are rapid responders. But I also don't want to be that guy who's teaching seminars. And they're like, hey, yeah, 15 years ago, I had like an amazing case. You know, I still like to have new cases. Right. 
It keeps um, you it keeps, it keeps you kind of honest to, to treat it just uh, I think to treat every so often and still hearing patient stories and remembering you know being in the trenches because if you didn't treat at all and you stopped altogether and just taught for years and years and years I think credibility goes down just a little bit right and you know there are some people like say on Soma Simple who are like oh now Urshan's cash based and we see hard patients we see centrally sensitized patients just because people are paying me cash and they don't have like a copay it doesn't necessarily mean I'm not seeing difficult patients you what know you when you mean cash based, that means like because like, we don't have that term, in, at least I know of in Canada. Um, we have like private and public. So you mean people are paying out of their own pocket to see you? Yeah, they don't. I don't take insurance. Even if they have insurance, I don't take it. They have to. Oh. They, they pay cash to see me. So I'm cash based too, then. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, because everyone and, in the U.S. basically has a copay, right? They have like a twenty or thirty dollar copay, and then their insurance reimburses on top of that, and. Um, it's hard if someone has a $20 copay, like, well, why would someone pay me my fee if they can pay and see someone else's $20? It's like, well, my value is different. Of course. Right? It, it's conveying that value that uh, that's hard, but if, if you can manage to do it, it's fantastic. Right. I mean, PT or physio should basically, we should be a commodity, not just this thing you throw away when it's zero or when it's $20 or even $40, but a massage therapist or personal trainer is like 60 or $80. Like they see value in in that versus PT. It's kind of like ah, I went two three times a week this week. I'm I'm just gonna skip the next one, you know. But yeah. they don't do that to their personal trainer. They don't do that to their hairstylist. Absolutely, and it's it, it's a really the funny thing. This is kind of switching gears off topic a bit, but I'm, this is something I'm more recently interested in. It is exactly that. I like I'm I'm into the psychology of decision making right now. That's my that's what I'm reading a lot about, and. Um, I've I, I uh, I've read and I've seen videos of physiotherapy kind of they help create and build physiotherapist businesses. And one of the things that um, they point out is that people are willing to skip their physiotherapy appointment to go get their hair done. Um, and as a physical therapist, you're like, what? Why would that even factor in? Why would that matter? Why would you rather skip uh, your physiotherapy session to get your hair done? The reason being is because when you leave um, your hair salon, you are told how great your hair looks. You're told that you get that feedback instantaneously that people are like, oh, you look great, every beautiful cut. However, when you leave a physiotherapy session, you don't, no one's going to say, oh my God, you're moving so much better or you, uh, you, you look like you're feeling so much better. I mean, maybe, but um, on the whole, people want that instant gratification or in physiotherapy at times, it's more of a, a process as opposed to just, uh, I give you, you know, 50 bucks and then half an hour, an hour, um, I'm, my goal is set. I have my goal. My hair is cut. I am great. I am happy with physical therapy. The, it's, a much, it's a much more time-intense process. Um, and I think when you talk about the value, you have to convey that to patients. That it's not something that's uh, you simply hand over money and then you feel better. Um, do you? F I, I mean, I find clinically there's a subset of patients who feel just because they are giving you money for a service that they must by by doing so they are simply um, taking away any of their own responsibility for their health um, because they're paying you to do it for them. I don't do you really find that I don't really find that in terms of cash base, probably because my fee is, you know, higher than what anyone would would pay any personal trainer, any massage therapist. I mean, you, when when I tell people, I can't. I, I, when someone's like, "Should I go cash based?" Um, with Updoc Media, we always tell them we can't tell you whether you should go cash based. We can't tell you whether you should open your own business, but we can we can help you do it. So, you know, you, you have to have a certain mindset for that, and when because my fees are so much higher, I feel like people are more compliant than they would have been if they had like a 20 or $30 copay. Yeah. It's funny. But because yeah, been, They're like, well, I, invest, I invested all this and one, no matter what they could have, they could be like, Hey, I'm paying this guy X amount of dollars to fix me. But my biggest message from day one, uh, almost like one of the, one of the second or third things I ever tell people is it doesn't matter what I do in terms of, um, the practice today or the, the, the visit today, I could, I might scrape you a little bit, might stretch you a little bit. I might just have you moving. Um, whatever the treatment is, if you walk out of here feeling better and moving better, it's not going to last, but I will give you something to keep those effects going. And if you don't do it, 
then you, it won't, it won't feel better or you, you know, the improvement won't last. So then I ask them, so if you walk out of here feeling better and moving better, and I give you something to maintain that, whose fault is it if you don't feel better the next time yeah. you come in? Well, to put the onus on them, that's great. Right. I mean, so, so my last question um, for today, kind of fitting that we're talking about this now, is regarding opening your own physiotherapy clinic. Um, would you say there's a fundamental piece of information or multiple pieces that one uh, would need to know to open their own clinic? And would you recommend it something everyone who is an outpatient orthopedics needs to try to be their own boss and grow their business? Well, right. Like I, like I said, what, what we say with um, Updoc Media, because we help people in their business, whether it's starting business or, um, you know, even enhancing their own business with social media or just outreach or advertising, is that we can't tell you whether you should open your business because I don't know what your, I don't know if you have to support your family and I don't know if you have a ton of loans to pay off. I don't know if it makes sense for you not to have income for six months to 12 months, depending on, you know, how busy it is. I don't know, but if you've done any kind of like SWOT analysis of your area, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it may not make any financial sense if you have, like if I had, if I had to start a business right now with five kids, I don't think I, I don't think I could do it. I mean, I, I did it with three kids and it was right when my wife had our third kid and we were a double income family and I was living the American dream of, I bought a house that I probably couldn't afford um, I wasn't making nearly as much, um, you know, we were like a double income family that relied absolutely on, on two incomes. And I barely had anything left over at the end of the month. So when she had the third kid and, you know, in, in the States, we only get three months, um, maternity leave. And if you don't work a year, then you only get six weeks. And she only worked 363 days at her current, um, physio job and they're like we can't give you the two extra days you know we can only give you six weeks off and she's like i know you just started your own practice but you know i'm not going back to work right because it wouldn't have made any sense i mean you can't go back to work at six weeks just to put our kids in daycare because like she would be working and only make enough to put our kids in daycare because daycare is super expensive so right. i'm like yeah you know but that's that's one of the reasons why i started blogging and pushing the edge tool and i was driven to get out there and uh, my practice did really blow up and I was really busy after like six weeks or I mean, I would say six months. I said, look, we're going to give this three or four months. And if I can't make this work, we have to sell the house and move in with my parents. Mm-hmm. So it, sometimes you have to have drive and you have to have risk to do it. If that is your type. I mean, and I was, I had to have the risk of supporting my family to be successful, but I, I can't say that it's, it's necessarily for you. I can't say that, cash basis for you or you should open your practice because there is a lot of risk with that. So I, I, I can't tell you that. I can I can kind of tell you different models on how to do it, but I can't tell you whether it's for you. Fair enough. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think um, just to finish off, would you say that one thing I found fascinating was you started the manualtherapist.com and all your your products because you, you wanted to find kind of another way to um, – I guess in essence, generate income when uh, just as a, a safety net, as it were, to uh, bring yourself out there to maybe, or was it to attract more patients to your clinic originally? Well, yeah, most people blog because they want to attract people to their business, which would be a clinic, right? Um, I just started selling the Edge tool on eBay, and then uh, it turns out Mike Reinold it reviewed someone, one of my students who stole my design. And when one of my other students said, hey, Mike Reinold just reviewed the Fiber Blaster, I'm like, who's Mike Reinold? Um, you know? So that's when I decided to start blogging because I wanted more people to be aware of my product. And initially, I was just making edge videos and stuff. But then the more and more I started blogging, I started just blogging about how I assess and how I treat. And you know, I made that 20-minute video for you because you asked me, how do I improve shoulder internal yeah, rotation? Good memory. <laughs> That's nuts, though. I mean, when I look back at that video, I'm like, geez, I can't believe I did all those techniques on that one kid. I remember he had like something like 100, 100 degrees of shoulder IR when I was done. 
Yeah, you. Uh, I, I after I saw that, I was just like, "This guy's amazing." He's just made me a twenty-minute like a how-to video. <laughs> right. Yeah, I had more time. <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. Again, I was thinking, like, where does he have the time for this? Incredible. I don't know. I don't know where I had the time for that. I, I was blogging a lot until like one or two a.m. and you yeah. know my marriage was suffering. But yeah, I, I put in the time, and now I have more time with my family. That's fantastic. Um, so yeah, I mean that's what I, I that's why I started blogging was to basically get more people to buy edge tools. I had no, I didn't know it would kind of turn into what it is now, and that that it could you know my products and my courses could could support my family, so I could spend so much more time with them. That's, that's, I didn't, that wasn't my goal, but that I'm, I'm happy to be able to basically support as many kids as God will give me. <laughs> And you know what, Erson? I will safely say to anyone listening to this now that you have been nothing but kind to me through my career. And um, despite how busy you've been and all the other kind of sex you have your, your hand into in terms of all the different websites you, you work on. And oh, you think mean S-E-C-T-S. That's yeah. funny. I was like, what? <laughs> no, that's, that's what I meant. Um, that's, that's, that's what I was going for. Um, all the different things you do. Uh, you've been very kind <clears throat> to the people that ask your opinion. You are a constant professional, and I'm sure um, a lot of people that you don't even know look up to you and try to emulate uh, what you've done. So by giving them some information on how you did it and some of the struggles you had, um, I think people are really going to appreciate that. I don't take a lot from it. So I wanted to appreciate. I really wanted to thank you for your time, and I appreciate you. Uh, spending this morning uh, talking to us here. No problem. And Jesse will attest that if you Facebook message me or you reach out to me on Twitter, email me, I, tr- I actually get back to you within within that day if I can. Yeah, you're fantastic. And don't think I don't, or anybody else I'm sure that does the same to you, doesn't appreciate it and think that's, uh, that's how professionals should act in terms of people are um, asking you questions and your advice and you're very good about responding personally. You don't, you don't have someone else do it for you. And, uh, that's, uh, it's a good, it's kind of, I think unique in a way right now in the physio social media world. So, um, thanks Latterson. I appreciate your time. No problem, Jesse. Just how long have you been out now? I'm approaching seven years. Whoa, it's nuts. You're past the five year mark. I know it's crazy. And yeah. I, I love it. I love what I yeah. do. And I, I still think, uh, I'm very happy that I'm a physical therapist and, um, I think the learning never ends. And as long as I'm kind of putting myself out there and doing things like this and kind of challenging what I think I know, um, I'm never going to get bored. And I think uh, you help with that. So thank you. Oh, 